Revelation chapter 11. I, I started on this last Sunday morning. I didn't get very far in it because I was talking about something else. But anyway, Revelation uh, chapter 11. Uh, to me, and I may be wrong in this, but if you've, if you've read through the book of Revelation, which I encourage you to, and I encourage you to do it several times, um, there's differences of opinions on every, on every word in Revelation. I mean, everybody's got some way that they interpret it different than somebody else does. So what I'm going to tell you, you just take with some salt and pepper and, and just, I don't know, throw it away or come up with your own or whatever. But some say that the, that the book of Revelation is... Um, it follows one thing after another. What do they call that? Chronolo I knew that word. Chronological order. That it's one thing after another. Um, I see it there in chapter 4, verse 1. After this, I looked. That's, chrono that's chronology. If I look, however, at... The beginning of chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 10, chapter 11, chapter 12, chapter 13, chapter 14, chapter 15, chapter 16, chapter 17, chapter 18. What am I looking at? Chapter 19, chapter 20. The same word starts out every one of those chapters. What is it? And. And is equal this and that now if my mom asked me did you mom I want ice cream did you eat green beans yes she says you get green beans and then your ice cream or in my case if you don't cry when the doctor gives you this shot I will get you ice cream afterward I cried, I kicked, and I knocked a needle right out of the doctor's hand. It shot all over the wall. He let out a curse, went out and got that needle that long, brought in three fat nurses to sit on me, and went, bam! And got ice cream. And got ice cream. Spoiled it. Um, the, the only thing that I could... I, 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 I'm just going to be honest. I, I'm looking at this... And don't see then, 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 then. I see and I saw, and I saw, and the fifth angel sounded, and this and that. Again, it's just, it's just a little bitty, tiny opinion. But I can't, I can't reconcile what I see in chapter 11 and what we've already seen in chapter 10. In chapter 10... If you remember that the angel declared in verse 7 that in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished. Right? So that's a, a, a declaration that he makes concerning that last trump. The last trumpet is, is blown. Um, let's see here. What verse? 14, 15, yeah, verse 15 of chapter 11. Okay, it's blown in verse 15 at, and of chapter 11. And the seventh angel sounded. And there were great voices in heaven saying, and see, remember, uh, we're looking, we're going to hear the voice of shout. Hear the voice of a shout. And the voice of the archangel. Um, and then it says, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. You would think then that the Lord comes down right after that, but he doesn't. We have seven vials of wrath to pour out before the Lord comes down from heaven in Revelation 19. And then we, we have the mention here of uh, in verse, uh, let's see here, verse 7 of chapter 11. When they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall, it's future tense, make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. Now, 
here's a question for you. In, chap in chapter 11, verse 7, it is apparent that after three and a half years has expired, that the beast, according to verse 7, makes war against the two witnesses and overcomes them and kills them. After they've completed 42 months, three and a half years, which is what we're going to look at this morning. Um, my question is, does the beast rise up at the beginning of the two witnesses' testimonies, accomplishing three and a half years simultaneously, or does the beast rise up after the witnesses have accomplished their testimony, giving you another three and a half years? Because we know the beast is going to reign for three and a half years, 42 months, 1260 days, a time times and dividing of time. That's the th ways the Bible puts it. You see what I'm saying, George? It's a question in my mind. No one's been able to satisfactorily explain it to me um, because I, I keep looking for an answer and I haven't found it yet. So that's just one of those question marks that I have. It seems to me that it's possible, and the Bible does do this at times, it seems to me that it takes chapter 11 and puts it in parentheses. What does that mean to us in English? When we make out a sentence and we put something in parentheses, it's like a secondary thought that is a thought on its own, but it complements the original sentence. Like... Um, Oh, let's see here. I don't know how to, how to make one. I'm sure I do know how to make one. I just can't think of one right now. But anyway, that's, that's what something in parentheses tells us. That it's a secondary thought giving us a little bit of background on what the main sentence is talking about. So that we have a little bit better understanding of it. And I, I tend to think that chapter 11 is in parentheses and possibly chapter 12. And, and for that matter, we have chapter 13, 14. We have all these, all these things going on uh, in these chapters after the last trump. And um, then you don't see the vials poured out uh, until, let's see here, chapter... What chapter is it? 16? Something like that? We'll get there. Anyway, just thought I'd throw that in there. To add just a little bit more confusion to your life. There was given to me a reed. Verse 1, like unto a rod. And the angel stood saying, Rise, and measure the temple of God, and the altar, and them that worship therein. Derek, thank you very much for that, young man. I appreciate that. Um... Uh, but verse 2, but the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles. So as I said last week, this, this obviously tells me there is now a, a difference put uh, in this case between Jew and Gentile. God's people and the devil's people. The wheat and the tares, in other words. The tares are without, they're trampling down uh, the outer part, the court. Uh, but inside the temple itself are God's people. And, um, and it says there in verse 2, In the holy city, Jerusalem, shall they tread underfoot for forty and two months. That means they're, they're just um, the Gentiles and the Gentile nations. Uh, we don't know exactly who, that, who all that's going to be. But anyway, the Gentile nations, it, it could have something to do with Ezekiel uh, 38, uh, with the prophecy of Gog and Magog and um, Gomer and all of those nations there that it mentions uh, and their spirits that rule over them. Uh, and uh, anyway, they're going to tread underfoot 42 months and I believe then simultaneously the two witnesses, and I will give power, and, see the word and, I will give power. Not then, after that, I will give power, but and, I will give power 
unto my two witnesses, they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days, clothed in sackcloth. Uh, these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Now, I mentioned last Sunday uh, morning that uh, at, least, at least for our benefit, uh, we already have knowledge of who or what the two witnesses are. This is one witness, the Old Testament. This is another witness, the New Testament. Uh, I don't, I don't, I'm not like, uh, I think it's Church of Christ. Church of Christ uh, pretty much says they can do without the Old Testament because they don't get anything out of it anyway. They say it's all fulfilled, none of it's for us, and so don't bother. But that doesn't fall in line with how the Scripture teaches you that you're going to learn something from the Bible. Paul said in the New Testament that all these things were written for our admonition and our learning unto whom the ends of the world come. Solomon said in the Old Testament, um, the thing that hath been is that which shall be, and there is no new thing under the sun. So we read what we read in the Old Testament, and this, what made, this is what made the Old Testament alive to me was when God clued me in on that, that the prophecies and the typologies that are in the Old Testament uh, are showing forth prophecies that are declared in the New Testament. And I'll give you f one of the first ones that I thought of when I started thinking along that line. My, my mind went to about the simplest story that uh, a young child can ever learn, especially a young boy can ever learn from the Bible, and that's the story of giants. And I remembered that I'd learned about Goliath. And I went back and I read 1 Samuel 17. And I just, I just stood there in awe over it. Because I'm going, okay. David said he's like a lion and a bear. And Revelation 13 says the beast is like a lion and a bear. And I'm going, nah. -uh. And then David, he's the shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He reaches down into his shepherd's bag and uh, he, Saul tries to give him his armor. David said, I haven't tried it. I'll just take the Lord with me. And so right there I'm looking at the Lord Jesus Christ and then I'm looking at the beast and I already know who won this and I see in Revelation that the beast had a deadly wound in one of his heads. Well, then I look at what David did. David took a rock, put it in his sling. Where did it hit him? Right upside the forehead. Conk. And David took his sword. What's the sword? It's the sword of the Spirit coming out of Jesus' mouth in Revelation 19. So I'm just sitting there in awe going, that is amazing. And I was, I was just tickled to death. And then once my mind opened up to that, I'm just like, my wife, I'd scared her to death doing this. I'd just jump up out of the chair after thinking about something, have to run back to the computer and look something up on the on the computer word search program where I search the Bible and look for, look for passages in the Bible and I'm just going, oh, that is so awesome. Um, Isaiah 28 bears that out uh, um, where it says, um, for uh, this shall be precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. And then Paul turns around in the New Testament and says that uh, these things that we learn in the Bible they're spiritually discerned, and we can't depend on what man's word says about God's word. We have to compare spiritual things with spiritual things. These spiritual things here compared with these spiritual things here. And I'll just ask you a quick question. Does the Old Testament give us a different gospel than the New Testament does? No, sir, not on the least. And I know some people. Fundamentals. But they believe in seven different Gospels uh, under hyper, -dis or, yeah, hyper dispensationalism. It's crazy to think that there's more than Paul said. If anybody preaches any other gospel, let him be accursed. And I just, man, I just won't have anything to do with them. But anyway, there is one gospel here. Uh, I was reading the story the other day of the Ethiopian eunuch and how he was reading out of the book of Isaiah. 
And Philip helped him out. The New Testament is there to show us what the Old Testament was talking about. Because the eunuch said, is he talking about himself or some other? And the Bible says that Philip began at that same passage, teaching him Jesus Christ. And when they got to a place of water, the eunuch said, what doth hinder me to be baptized? Peter, or, uh, Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. In other words, the doctrine of belief first, then baptism, water baptism. And he said, I believe that Jesus uh, Christ is the Son of God. And so this eunuch was saved with, by what he was reading in the Old Testament. He found out that that prophecy in Isaiah 53 had been, had been fulfilled perfectly in every word. He found that out, and he rejoiced over that. And there is a, believe it or not, that is, I believe, how the Coptic church in Ethiopia ended up having its uh, birthing or whatever is that eunuch goes back to Candace, the queen of Ethiopia, telling about Jesus Christ, spreading it around, and you have Christianity in Ethiopia. Uh, so anyway, um, but that's, that's what I think, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of show you that a different way. Um, tell you what let's do. Let's go, since I'm on this topic, we'll go back to these... Um, these numbers here, that's teeth. Wait till I show you that. Turn to Zechariah chapter 4. Zechariah chapter 4. And see, I had them tell me, George, that they said, well, Noah was saved by works. He built the ark. He had to build the ark so he could be saved. Well, they forgot the part where it says Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. He found grace before God ever had him build the ark. And then they say Abraham had to do works by uh, taking his son, putting him on the altar, and about to kill him. And I'm going, no, because Abraham already believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness before he ever took Isaac to the to what it ends up being Jerusalem, Mount Moriah. And it just, when you actually examine that doctrine with the light of Scripture, it falls completely apart. I mean, there is just nothing that can sustain it. And I don't see how, well, I do know how they do it. They constantly repeat it and reiterate in every sermon that's preached. And I mean, they can't go 15 minutes without sticking it back in everybody's head that this is what you better believe or you, you won't be in good standing in this church. And it's, it's almost like a, I don't want to say that, but anyway. Zechariah chapter 4. Now, the, the chapter, the verse said there in uh, Revelation that, um, that these, are, these, um, these two witnesses are the two olive branches and the two candlesticks uh, that are mentioned in the Bible. And those are mentioned in the book of Zechariah. So let's start with chapter 4, verse 1. The angel that talked with me came again and waked me. That sounds like people in our church. Amen. Might as well amen it. I've sat down where you sat before and went. The angel that talked with me came again and waked me. As a man, that is, I need to put that sign up over the back of the church with this passage on it. That a man that is wakened out of his sleep and said unto me, What seest thou? And I said, I have looked, and behold, a candlestick all of gold with a bowl upon the top of it and his seven lamps thereon. So we know now exactly what candlestick he's talking about. Um, and his seven lamps thereon, and the seven pipes to the seven lamps, which are upon the top thereof. He's speaking of what John saw in Revelation chapter 4, what Moses built back, I think, in the... Where is it? Book of Exodus. God gave the instructions. God showed Moses the pattern up in heaven. Moses had it built. The candlestick that was in the tabernacle of the wilderness. The one that was a model of the one that John saw in the spirit up in heaven in Revelation 4. And now we see them here in the book of Zechariah. 
Anyway, the seven pipes to the seven lamps which are upon the top thereof. Verse 3. And two olive trees by it. One upon the right side of the bowl and the other upon the left side thereof. Now remember, the, um, um, the angel explained to John that these two witnesses are the candlesticks and the two olive trees. So think of these two olive trees as one witness on one side, the other witness on the other side, which is what you have here. You don't have New Testament mingled in with Old Testament. You have a clear division in your Bible and a clear division among people. The Jews to this day, they don't, have a, they don't, they don't go to the temple on, on Saturday and have somebody read out of that Gentile New Testament. They won't touch that. So they don't have that in their Bible. They have this. They don't have this. We have this. We weren't here or these are not us here in the Old Testament. It's Israel. So even amongst people, there is a clear difference in the Bible that they have. And, um, boy, I, I am gleaning some things right now uh, from the Word of God, from the Old Testament. Some things, some theories I've had for a while that turned out to be true. And it has to do with how right this Bible is. Uh, but anyway, um, so here we clearly have two witnesses, one on one side, one on the other. And they're both saying the same thing, but it's like your eyes. God gave you two eyes, and if you only use one, if you have one eye, you lose depth perception. Don't waste your time going to see a 3D movie, because you're not going to get it. Okay, it won't make sense to you. When you cover one eye and only see with one eye, like your television screen. Your television screen, you can't see depth. You can see things get smaller in the background, but you can't see and measure depth or how far away something is when you add the second eye and because and i figured this out because my mama for christmas got me a viewmaster one time and i used to look at that thing all the time and it, for a while i wondered at how come those pictures were so neat looking in there that it didn't look like pictures that i'd seen like in a magazine i just clicked through that and just look at that and wonder then i found out that because they were taken with two different cameras pointed at slightly different angles, focused on the same object, that because of that, one eye was seeing this camera angle, this eye was seeing this camera angle, and it gave the picture depth inside my mind. Fascinating stuff. So watch this. Israel, right now, is partially blinded. Why? They don't read the New Testament. They don't believe it. They won't read it. In fact, their rabbis, their rabbis tell them, especially in, there's a couple guys that, uh, they're, they're Messianic Jews. They pass out tracts to the Jews down at the Temple Mount. And whenever they talk to people, especially younger people, some of these young guys spill the beans. They said, uh-uh, our rabbi said not to have anything to do with you. But he said, I'm a Jew. I'm a Jew just like you are. Uh-uh, our rabbi said, you, you ain't like us. <laughs> and I mean, they gave him the business, you know. And, uh, but their rabbis tell them, don't you read that, new, that Gentile Bible. Don't you read that New Testament. Oh, that's dangerous. Don't you read that. And don't let the Gentiles tell you uh, how the Old Testament is supposed to be read. We're the ones who tell you that. What does that sound like? Huh? Catholic Church will tell you what it means. Mormon Church will tell you what it means. Jehovah's Witness Church will tell you what it means. Branch Davidians, will, David Koresh will tell you what it means and what it says. Whew. Aren't you glad you're free? Amen. I hate bondage. So anyway, so now we're getting an idea. There's a picture in the Old Testament and the New Testament has just told us what that picture is. So that we understand it. The two olive trees. Can you think of a doctrine in the New Testament that deals with olive trees? This ought to be easy. Olive tree, nice and pretty. Oh, you're going to make me tell it to you? You know, I read the Bible for a living. I do. 1 Corinthians 11. 1 Corinthians 11. 
Uh, I'm wrong. I'm wrong. Why am I wrong? 2 Corinthians 11. No. Huh? Yes. Romans. Here it is. The other 1 Corinthians. Romans. Yeah. Look at verse 17. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou, being a wild olive tree, wert graft in among them, and with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree. In other words, what, what was the most, in back in Jesus' time, what was the most significant thing about the olive berry? Was it the olives themselves? Or the, the oil. Always the oil. The oil was good as, if you had good olive trees, man, you could be a wealthy man just selling the oil because everybody used it. They used it for their cooking. They used it to light their lamps. They just used it for just about, they used it as medicines. They just used it for everything. And here, it's telling us that it, ha, it relates to understanding the doctrines of the Bible. Because God, and having faith, because God took the natural branches that were on there, but they weren't bearing any fruit. So what good are they? And he took them and broke them off and cast them away. But then he tells us, as the Gentiles, because we were wild olives, grafted in, so now we receive of the, the goodness and the fatness of the olive tree, which I believe is Christ. And then they, um, but he said, uh, verse 20, well, because of unbelief, they were broken off, and thou standest by faith, but be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed, lest he also spare not thee, because people have gone into disbelief. They started, they started out like Saul, King Saul, prophesying, preaching, all oh, just, all oh, it's good. Then they end up before which? The day before they fall on their own sword. It's because Saul just stopped believing what God said. In fact, Samuel told him that. He said, because thou rejected the word of the Lord, God has rejected thee. And so anyway, uh, I know the bell rang, but that's, that's what I'm taking from the significance of these olive trees and these two witnesses. They are, they are going to be perfect, perfect representations of the Word of God is what they're going to be. Which, now that I've said that to you, uh, if you look, if you want to do your homework this week, hint, hint, read through this chapter again and again. You're going to see that these two witnesses have power that most mortal men, well, no mortal man has. They have power to make it rain. They have power to make it stop. They can cast fire out of their mouth. They can cast out spirits. They heal people. They anoint them with oil and heal people. It's amazing what they do. Look at their ministry. And then take those same things and apply them to the two testaments of the Word of God in your life right now. What is it? that God cannot do through His Word. Can you hear us say amen to that? Let everybody online hear you say amen to that. That's better. Father, we love you and we love this book. It has riches in it, Lord, that are unbound. And Father, I will never, never in one lifetime, not even in ten lifetimes, ever glean from this book the depth of all the riches and the fatness that it carries. But Father, while we're down here in this world, help us, dear God, to spend our time wisely studying the Word of God, meditating on the Word of God, talking to you, listening to your voice as we read the Scriptures. And God, I pray, dear God, that you would always keep us prepared and sharp for the days that we live in. Father, bless those that are in the hospital today. Bless those, Lord, who are sick. Bless those, Father, who just need help. We pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen.